first is chapter 20. It's inward. Then after chapter 20 of the book of Exodus, he gave what's called the civil law. That's outward. That's how we interact with each other. We live in a lawless nation. Uh, I'll probably be preaching along that line tonight out of the 10th Psalm. But then we have ceremonial law. That's what we're into right now. And it's just simply how we approach God. Uh, you cannot approach God just any way you want to. I believe it needs to be in holiness. The Bible said we're to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And then the Bible says that we are to uh, come respectfully, reverently into His presence. I ask people not to call me reverend. I joke a little bit about that sometime. Uh, but the word reverend is only used one time in your Bible. His name is Reverend. I'll tell people, call me Brother Dave, Pastor, Preacher. Uh, call me David or call me for supper. Uh, any way you want to do it. Uh, but he's Reverend this morning. All right, we've been in chapter number 20. Uh, I think we left off. Uh, let me see where we did leave off. I think we, we left off in... Uh, was it verse number 16? Verse number 16. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Be careful with this thing of gossip. You say, well, what if it's right? He didn't say if it was right or wrong. He said it was a tale that's been told and you bear it. That means you carry that thing with you where you go. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of people, they... They, they say things that maybe they need to keep to themselves, all right? Uh, if you can pray for somebody, pray for them. Uh, somebody said, if you want to talk about somebody, talk about them when you're on your knees to God, and God can give them a little bit of help. It's got to be careful with tail-bearing. The reason I say that, if there is sin involved or a problem involved, I as a pastor treat private sin privately. If nobody knows anything about it, then I go to that individual. We try to get that thing worked out, taken care of before it spreads. I treat public sin publicly. Once it gets to be public knowledge, then you have to bring it into the arena of the church at that particular time because people know that sin's going on, and if they don't see the rebuke of that sin, then they... Uh, think that you're letting that sin go. You can't do that. So when it becomes public in nature, then we deal with it. Now, as it becomes public, I deal with only the people that know about it. All right. I don't just bring something before the church when just a husband and wife and maybe one more member knows about it, then I'll deal with those three. What you try to do is you try to minimize these things and deal with them, make sure they're dealt with rightly, but that Hey, you don't want to bring tales somewhere else. Why? Because you are, at that point, maximizing what's going to have to be done. To whom much is given, much is required. So that, re that requires a pastor to step it up. You get to Matthew chapter number 18. He talks about if you go to the altar and bring your gift, and you remember that your brother has an alt against you, not you against him. That you leave your gift at the altar, you go to that brother, and you reconcile yourself to that brother. You work it out between the two of you, perfect will of God. If he won't hear you, then you take a witness with you that in the mouth of two or three witnesses are things established. That way you've got somebody who doesn't have a dog in that fight that hears what both sides say. It's, it's kind of like a mediator, but at the same time, then... He hears what both individuals say because sometimes you can talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one and they may say that you said something that you didn't say or you did something that you didn't do and it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. So it's good in that case. If you can't reconcile it, leave it alone. Bring somebody else with you that you can trust to mediate or at least be uh, in the middle on that thing and hear both sides. If they won't hear the brother that you take with you, then you have to bring them before the church. And, but there are steps of doing that. Now, I told somebody, every time I visit you, you're on step one. All right. And I, I just laugh about it. I visit people and they're not on step one. But if there's ever an issue and I come to talk to you about it, I am actually on step one. 
Because then if you can't work it out, then you've got to involve a deacon and bring a deacon with you. And then if you can't work it out, then it becomes public. So be careful with spreading things that you hear. Somebody said one time, don't believe anything you hear and only half of what you see. They gave you an illustration. You say, well, I saw it. A man looked out a window one time and he saw an old man with a pistol chasing a young man down the street, finally cornered him, stuck that gun in his face and said, give me the billfold. He said he robbed that man. He didn't rob that man. He's getting his billfold back. All right, so you got to be careful when you don't see it all. I remember on Fox News several years ago, and I'll give you a real good illustration. Boy, they had one of the Fox News commentators with a camera on the streets. I don't know what he was doing. And about that time, there was a confrontation. A police officer on one side of the street, he hollered for a young man on the other side of the street that for him to get your hands up, all right? The young man had a pistol in his hand. The young man took off running. Then he heard a shot ring, and the young man fell on the sidewalk. He was running away. And hey, on live TV now, he was saying, I saw him shoot a young man in the back that was running away from him. I, I'm an eyewitness. Went on for a little while, and it found out that the police officer never fired a shot. The young man tripped, dropped his pistol, and it went off. The only gun that was fired was the one he had in it. Boy, you're talking about having to retract some stuff. They, they, were, they were backpedaling all the way. Be careful with tail bearing. All right, now you don't want to do that. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. That means to stand against him in a wrong way when he's accused of something. You've got to be careful with what judgments that you give about your neighbor who's out. That's, that's the ones that live around you. I learned a long time ago, give people the benefit of a doubt. One, you don't know motivation. You may see action. You don't see motivation. You don't hear the history of what just took place. And sometimes you can, you can get things wrong if you're not real careful. So he's just talking about just be careful with tail bearing and then when you stand against the blood of thy neighbor. In other words, uh, he's got a death sentence or some kind of great sentence on him and you've got to be careful standing behind that. Uh, if you can stand behind it right, go ahead. If you can't, you better leave it alone. He said, I'm the Lord. Look at verse 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Hate is a strong word. I do not know anybody in this world that I hate. That's, that's a stout word to hate somebody. Oh, you know, hatred in the heart, that's, that's just about the same as committing murder in the heart. Now, I hate what some people do. Did you hear the difference? God hates the sin. God loves the sinner. I hate what some people do, and I pray for them. I hate nobody. To have hatred in your heart is a very strong thing. We're not to hate people. We're to hate sin. We're not to hate people. But he said that you're not to hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt not in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Be careful when you rebuke your neighbor. There's difference between admonishment and a rebuke. Rebuke strong. The Bible said that the pastor is to reprove, then rebuke, then exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. All right, he has to do that uh, from the pulpit. I think one thing has really hurt our nation is there's very little rebuke and uh, reproving coming out of the pulpits. Very little coming out of there. Everything today is exhortational. You know, you're just building everything up. Sometimes there has to be reproof, and then sometimes it has to turn into rebuke. But then you've got to exhort them also. All right, old man, old preacher, one time I heard him preaching. He must be 85, 90 years old, real old. And he said you reprove them, rebuke them, and if anybody's left, you exhort them just a little bit. All right, well... Well, you got to be careful with that. You don't, you don't want to under-exhort. That's like with children. you got to be careful with kids. If all they hear is rebuke all the time, 
Sometimes you got to pat a child on the back. You got to let them know they're loved. You got to let them know they do right. If all you do is rebuke your children, you're going to damage your relationship with your kids. You can't do that. You, you've got to have uh, that, that respect both ways, even though they're children. Now, notice what he said. Thou shalt not in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. I don't rebuke my neighbors often. I reprove them pretty good. I had one one time that uh, when we, we hadn't been there too long, had Brother Don settle out there. <laughs> and the guy next door, he was just being a pain all the way around. And he drove his little golf cart right up to the, the line where we lived. I'm talking about right up. He's already put green uh, poles down there. They're going to put a fence up between us, which is fine. I don't have any problem with that. Good fences make good neighbors, right? And he pulled up and he got off and was staring at me in my backyard. And I just walked up to him and I looked at him and I said, fella, you got a problem. <laughs> and that's exactly, Barbara was on deck. That's a, I said, fella, you got a problem. And uh, he expressed his problem and I told him that my yard, my business in a nice way, uh, what I was doing was not illegal, immoral, and shouldn't have been bothering him at all over there. Uh, I was out sunbathing my... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that, 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 would, that would be tough on anybody. Amen. But what I was doing was not an unbiblical thing, all right? And uh, sometimes you've got to do that because, you know, neighbors have to learn. These boundaries that you've got, set their boundaries all right you got to be careful with your boundaries there so he said and not suffer sin upon him you don't want anything done wrong to him any more than you want it done wrong to you look at verse 18 thou shalt not avenge nor bear a grudge against the children of thy people let me quote you a quote out of verse vengeance is mine thus saith the lord i will repay there's a difference between praying for justice. I've been dealing with that here lately because sometimes we need to pray that justice is done. Uh, you've got to have justice sometimes, folks, but you've got to have justice in law. Uh, law needs to be equal all the way around that thing, and sometimes people use the law unlawfully, and sometimes you've got to have justice there. That's not vengeance. When I pray that way, I pray for their salvation. I pray they get right with God. I figure if they get right with God, then they'll get right with everybody else that's involved in it. If they don't get right with everybody else that's involved with it, they didn't get right with God to start with. When you get right with God, you'll get right with the ones that you're having problems with or whatever if you've done any wrong to them. But notice what he said. Thou shalt not avenge. That's not what this thing's about. You let God take care of of revenge vengeance is mine thus saith the lord i will repay and when he said that he may not do it when you want him to do it but you let god take care of the vengeance part but he said but thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself i am the lord and that's part of what's called the royal law when you go into the new testament our lord summed up the Ten Commandments, one, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy strength. And then he said, and thy neighbor by thy, uh, as thyself. And all of the rest of the laws, moral laws, from the second one all the way down to the tenth one, deal with your relationship with your neighbors. So we need to keep that thing right. He said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. If he does you wrong, you don't always have to reprove him or rebuke him. Just love him. Sometimes you don't need to deal with things. I, one thing I have gotten into problems with as a younger man was dealing with things that I really didn't have to deal with. My pastor, Dr. Jerry Clark, he's going on to be with the Lord now, but he told me one time, you minimize he said, don't ever maximize. You don't fight a fire with gasoline. If you can pray over it and slow that thing down, he said, you minimize that. It makes it easier to deal with. So you do that with your neighbor. Verse number 19, ye shall keep my statutes. Now, this is very interesting. Thou shalt not let thy can cattle gender with a diverse kind. Now, we all do that. If you've got cows, you've probably got, uh, you know, you've got little bit of 
of everything. You've, <laughs> you've got black Angus, red Angus, a little Charolais mixed in. I hope you don't. Well, I'll tell you what, you get a Charolais bull and Angus, you're going you're gonna to lose some cows real quick, all right? They throw a big calf. But you get, hey, these big old Santa Gertrude bulls. I remember Brother Harold had one of these uh, big old Bremer bulls out there one time. Uh, great, that thing must have weighed 2,500 pounds. I was scared to death of that bull. Uh, but he said, you're not the gender. You say, why? God, in his wisdom, said that everything was to bring forth after its kind. You know, God even set a place to where different animals, different kinds. Uh, you got your dogs, you got the English bulldogs, you got English setters, and then you got French poodles, and then you got Mexican chihuahuas, and you got all that. He, he for whatever reason, known to God, and, I, and I'm not having any problem with the cattle, I want you to understand that, but under this ceremonial law, he said they weren't to gender them together. They were to keep these uh, separate, all right? Uh, you know, we, we get mules by uh, using a donkey and a mare, and that, that's just the way it is. You get a mule that way. I remember back on the farm, we used to have two mules, Brownie and Jack. Uh, Jack was black, and Brownie was a big old brown mule. And I thank God they were retired by the time I got old enough to do any plowing. So most of my plowing was done with a little Ford end tractor and uh, then, uh, you know, but he's talking about not to gender them. And in the same breath, he said, thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. You're not to grow their tomatoes out in the middle of their uh, wheat or rye or oats or he told them they were to keep what they were, and basically we do that. Uh, you know, there's some things that uh, they will blend together. If you've got cucumbers and you've got uh, cantaloupe growing together out there, uh, those, those two will actually give you a cross, and I don't know how good it tastes, but it'll cross up on you, all right? So he's talking to them under the civil law, but he said they're not to sow thy field with mingled seed. Now, the reason I say these are his statutes. This is under civil law because of what he says in the last part. Neither shall a garment mingle of linen and woolen come upon thee. You say, why did they do that? Because of the priesthood. These priests, when they were before God, wore linen. But they wore a lot of woolen clothes when they were out and other things of that nature. Uh, you can like, liken that into some of this modern dress that people got on. It amazes me they have a hat on and a, a coat and gloves and short shorts. <laughs> and I'm walking around, and I'm thinking, these don't go together, folks, all right? I don't know what short shorts go together with anyway. But at the same time, I, you know, you say, well, I, I'm a man, and I wear them. The Bible taketh no pleasure in the legs of a man. So I'll <laughs> quote that a little bit out for you a little bit. But hey, people, they dress crazy. I mean, underwear or for underwear, and you go to Walmart, and women are wearing them, showing all the way around, and, and everything else. Uh, dressing in a right manner. I don't always wear a suit and tie. Most time, you find me in a nice shirt and a pair of blue jeans. Some people, I had one lady one time said, you don't look like much of a preacher to me. Well, I don't know what preachers really look like. If you think a suit and a tie makes a man of God, then I... I, I I, I can take you to some on television, I guess, at real holy. <laughs> All right? So, but he's talking about the way they dress. That's why I'm taking this, because he said, Thou shalt keep my statutes. These were laws given to Israel. Now, not every law given to Israel applies to you and I. Because Christ fulfilled the ceremonial law. But I think some common sense needs to prevail in there. I, th I think you ought to dress to impress. If I was going out and looking for a job, I'd have on a white shirt, black dress slacks, wingtip shoes. I'd be shaved and my hair combed. And when I went out, I mean, I would, I would try to uh, at least impress them that I had a little integrity going looking for a job. Uh, it just, hey, you know, it doesn't take much to stand out in the day we live in. It don't take much to stand out in this day. You can stand out quick. 
So anyway, he deals with the statutes. Now, and whosoever lieth carnally with a woman that is a bondmaid betrothed to an husband and not at all redeemed. Now, I want to deal with that first because the next couple of three verses here, people are going to have a problem with it otherwise. Now, what he's talking about here, he's talking about a woman that's a bondmaid. In other words, she's a servant of a man, but she becomes betrothed engaged to that man. Now, engagement today is not betrothal of uh, years gone by. Uh, betrothal or betrothal in the Bible is as binding as marriage. That's why he dealt with Mary and Joseph and called Mary uh, Joseph's espoused wife before they came together. All right, She was betrothed to him. And he was minded to put her away privily because he thought that there was uncleanness that had taken place in her life uh, to where she was not a pure. You know, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And I'm glad God just straightened that right out. And Joseph did just exactly what God said. Now we're talking about a young woman here. Now she, she's, a, she's a bondmaid, but her husband wants to marry her and her become a wife. And she's not at all redeemed. That word redeemed means bought back by anybody. <clears throat> a lot of times there was money exchanged uh, in this. A lot of the bond servant, we had a lot of that in the beginnings of our nation. Uh, they called it indentured servants. Uh, that you know, in order to get a free ticket to the United States for a certain length of time, they would become an indentured servant. Uh, they did that for two reasons. One, if there was money involved or two to learn a trade. Sometime you worked with somebody as a servant to him in order to learn a trade, and people still do that. But he's talking about a young woman that's not redeemed back. She belongs to that man because of transaction. You say, well, they shouldn't have sold her. I don't know what, what, the, what it was uh, that caused that. It could be something that, uh, where she owed money or it could, and he paid it. could have been anything. The thing of it is, she has, she's his bondservant. She's betrothed to him, and nobody has paid that debt off. She's not redeemed, so she is completely his. One, because she's his bondservant, but two, because she's betrothed. When he became engaged to this young woman, that is a lifetime thing. They didn't just bring... Uh, Moses gave them the right to a bill of divorcement in the Old Testament. That was when one was found unclean, and then they had what they call the tokens of virginity. I'm not going to deal with that this morning, but they had a way uh, that proved beyond a doubt if a young woman was pure when she came to that marriage bed. They knew how to do that, and then they could bring the cloths of that uh, uh, token of virginity and then, buddy, you better not speak anything wrong against a virgin of Israel. When you did, you got in trouble with everybody. But here we find that she's not redeemed, nor freedom given to her. He didn't set her loose. If that man lies carnally with her, she shall be scourged. They shall not be put to death because she was not free. But at the same time, She's to be scourged. Boy, that's, a, that's serious business. Boy, they scourged people. I mean, they literally stripped the hide off of them. Uh, in Roman days, they used what's called a cat of nine tails. And in the, in the nine tails on that whip, they put pieces of glass and bone and metal in there to where when they, when they beat you, at, when they went around your stomach, that stuff it gripped and they just ripped it loose on your scourgings, a lot of times ended up in death. He said not be put to death, but she is to be scourged. But notice verse 21, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, even a ram for a trespass offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering before the Lord for his sin which he had done, the sin which he had done shall be forgiven him. You say, boy, that's, that's, that's not treating them equally. They weren't equal. She was betrothed. 
This young lady was engaged and she had a relationship with another man. Now, that man was not scourged because he wasn't in a relationship, but what he did was sin. But hers was the greater sin. She belonged to another man. That betrothal was a two-way street. She accepted him. He accepted her. They were going to get it married, and for whatever reason known only to her, she became impure in that thing. So hers was the greater uh, judgment because evidently he was not married, he was not betrothed, and he had to pay a price for it. Verse number 23, When ye shall come into the land, and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then ye shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised three years, Shall it be uncircumcised unto you, it shall not be eaten up. Now, when they came into Canaan, they, they were very careful when they besieged places if they had to cut down trees in order to ramp up or in order to uh, open gates, uh, use them for rams. They didn't use fruit trees. They used trees that were used for timber. God told them, leave the fruit trees alone. But... Because the land was defiled in the eyes of God for three years, they could not eat any fruit off of these trees. They just had to let them grow, drop their fruit, let the animals eat it. They did that for three years. Now on the fourth year, verse 24, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord withal. Now three years you let it hit the ground. Fourth year you gathered it all and gave it to God. It was holy to the Lord. Fourth year they got to God. The five is a number of grace. Now, notice what he said in verse 25, And in the fifth year ye shall eat of the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. Again, these are statutes given to the, uh, the children of Israel. But for three years when they came in, see, they're not in Canaan yet, they're at Mount Sinai. He said, you come in, you don't eat the fruit for three years. Fourth year you give it to God. The fifth year it's yours and anything you plant from that time on. Verse number 26, Ye shall not eat in anything with the blood. We already dealt that in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 4. I think verse number 17, the Bible said that the life of the flesh is in the blood. He said, I've given it to you upon the altar. And he said, we're not to eat it. He told Noah when he got off of that ark, when he told him for the first time he could have a steak dinner if he wanted to. Prior to that, everybody were vegetations. He came out, he said, basically every living thing that moveth shall be meat unto you along with the herbs. But he said, not the blood. You say, well, it's just law. It was before law. You go to Acts chapter 15, and he told the, the Gentiles to abstain from Blood and fornication. He said, if you do these two things, he said, you'll do well. So he said not to eat the blood. Then he said, neither shall you use enchantment. Hmm. Ah, oh, boy, enchantment. What's enchantment? Boy, that's, that's uh, kind of a hold a spell over somebody. <laughs> Hypnotize them or whatever. You're not to use enchantment uh, against them. And then he said, in to observe times. You say, what's observing time? Well, we do, we do that all the time in our society. I'm not talking about holy days. I'm not talking about uh, days that you get off President's Day and all this type of stuff. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about Friday the 13th. Uh, some people are scared to death. Hey, Friday before last was Friday the what? 13th. Isn't that a blessing? Barbara and I were married on Friday the 13th. I wasn't afraid of that. I was afraid of walking under a ladder. You know, we had all these things. Don't step on a crack. You break your back, grandmother's back, you know, when you're walking down the sidewalk. Man, we wouldn't step on a crack. I'd shorten a step or lengthen a step to get over that thing. Enchantments, all right? We use that also. A lot of people look in to, uh, not in, what uh, the, the lady used to put the uh, stuff in there all the time, you know, the Zodiac type stuff, you know. We're, we're not to observe days. The only days God told them to observe were the feast days, the Sabbaths. That was the seventh day of the week. 
That was done every week. And then there were your feast days that he gave to them that they were to observe. But when, they come in, when they're coming in the land, hey, you've got a whole lot of people throw salt over their shoulder. You know, one of them walk around a tree on one side, and the other one bread and butter. You know, <laughs> hey, y'all know all these little old things, don't you, huh? Well, that, he said you're not to observe times. Uh, I don't care who, who was that woman that put all that stuff. Jeannie Dixon. Yeah, Jeannie Dixon used to put all that prophecy mess. People just went crazy over that stuff. You don't observe times. You just honor the statutes of God every other day or work days. And if you've got the day off, then it's a play day. Play day doesn't usually get payday. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But at the same time, he said you're not to observe times. Then he went on and said, Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. He's talking about nothing wrong with beards. Nothing wrong with pe- keeping them. Great. Nothing wrong with cutting your hair, folks. But this is this oddball crazy stuff that you got going on. You know, people, uh, you know, just all kinds of crazy stuff with beards and hair and everything else up there. He said you're not to be worldly. Uh, somebody asked if I had anything against growing beards. Absolutely not. God gave you one, grow it. I don't grow one. That's just a personal choice. They aggravate me. I can't get past the fourth day to save my neck. I lay my head down on that pillow and it shoves that beard into my face and I get up and go shave my face and go back to bed. I, I've never got past about four. I used to wear a mustache in the military and then someone that got home, I wore a mustache. Uh, but at the same time, not to be worldly in appearance. These are things that the heathen did. Matter of fact, he dealt with it. Verse 28, and I'm going to deal with it, and we'll shut down. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead. They used to cut themselves. Uh, that's demonic in its nature. Sometimes people that are dealing with things they ought not, they, uh, they start cutting their self, mutilating their bodies. They're not, not, not to do that. Listen, your body belongs to the Holy Spirit of God. It's His. I don't like to be cut. I told somebody, I told a man one time, you shoot me, don't you dare cut me. I don't want to be cut. You shoot me and get it over with. Don't, don't take a knife to me or a busted bottle or whatever you got in your hand. So he's talking about cutting. But then he said, print any marks upon you, I am the Lord. We live in days of tattoos. You parents teach your children not to tattoo their flesh. That has gotten to be big. I mean, now people get Jesus tattoos. and all. Uh, You say, what's a Jesus tattoo? I mean, you're, you're talking about the Lord with the tattoo. He said not to put marks on your body. That's kind of like putting a Jesus save sign over a bar. All right? That's, 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 there are right things and wrong things. And it's not a sin unto death. But I would advise you to tell your children not to put marks on them. When I was a little boy, drunk soldiers and sailors are the ones that had tattoos. Uh, they did that. I remember my dad one time over in North Africa when they got off of the front lines for a little bit. He's with Patton. They went out, partied all night, and dad was going to get an American eagle put from shoulder to shoulder covering his whole chest. He sobered up in time. He didn't get that done, thank God. God for that, amen, and got back to where it's supposed to. Now, I'm just, I'm just telling you, teach your children all this extra piercing. It's, it's eyes and nose and tongues and lips. and uh, Stay away from that. Don't, don't, don't get into that, all right? Hey, we're, we're, to, we're to be different from that. Uh, it's not a sin unto death, but I think it's a type of worldliness that God's children need to stay away from. Teach your children, don't get the tattoos done, all right? Some of you here may have a tattoo. A lot of people get them before they get right or even know any better. I thank God uh, the only tattoos I've got on me are what I got in the mines. Every time you got cut in the mines, when you got coal dust in it, it leaves a black print for life. The only other place was I had a young lady in 
school. I was messing with her a little bit, and she took a pencil and stabbed me in the thigh and broke the lead off underneath the skin. I've got a blue mark. I carry that lead, I guess, as long as I, I live. But be careful with what you do with your bodies, all right? You say, why? Because that body you've got belongs to the Lord. Your body belongs to God. Now, if something belongs to God, I think we need to be right careful with what we do with that body when it's His, okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for the day. Thank you for the Word of God, Lord. And I know you're talking to the children of Israel, but Lord, we can make some applications to help us as God's people to walk holy, to walk upright in this world, Lord, and not to do anything that might bring a reproach to God. Pray you'd bless this service to come, be with our people that are out. Give us a good day, and then, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, going to the prayer rooms. You need to.